So um, all the more time, though, for our three excellent speakers. So we, we have plenty of time for discussion. We may finish a bit early for lunch. Let, let's see how it goes. Um, so I'll very briefly introduce our, our three speakers in the order that they will present. Uh, when they've all spoken uh, for 15, 20 minutes each, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. And I'll take questions, perhaps in twos or threes. So our first speaker will be the Right Honourable Lord Justice Singh, Rudin Singh. Um, who is a member of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, as you all know, also a founding member of Matrix Chambers, um, a leader academic, of course. Um, he's also, and this is possibly relevant for our discussion today, uh, president of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, and of course also has a, a long and distinguished um, record of litigation. Um, uh, I believe his last case that was taken to the European Court of Human Rights was not less than our scaly versus the UK. Um, so uh, of great interest for our um, discussion. Um, we'll then have um, Humana Soli, who is a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg, and also a doctoral candidate at Goethe University um, in Frankfurt. Um, and her research, and indeed her presentation, will focus on the inter-American human rights system particularly socio-legal approaches to human rights, uh, norms and institutions, and the concept of transformative constitutionalism. I'm looking forward to hearing something about that. And then finally, um, anne Catherine Speck, uh, who is yet another member of the Human Rights Law Implementation <laughs> Project team, um, uh, but who is also just as interesting for today, uh, co-director of the European Implementation Network, EIN, which is an NGO based in Strasbourg, which works with civil society actors across the Council of Europe to promote the full and swift implementation of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and Anne, um, apart from being involved in the project, is also a doctoral student at Middlesex University, I'm pleased to say, and also has experience of working with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. So some of the points that Murray made about the so-called democratic critique of human rights. I think Anne is also well placed to comment on how you get involved um, with the Parliamentary Assembly at the Strasbourg level. So um, without more ado, um, I'd like to ask um, Lord Justice Singh to begin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for the kind invitation to speak at this conference. I'm sorry I can't stay for the whole day. I would have liked to, but I'm pleased that I can be here uh, for this morning. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to others' contributions and our discussion. The focus of my presentation is going to be on the relationship between the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and courts in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to make seven points. But the first is that when the Human Rights Act was drafted and introduced some 20 years ago, Section 2 was quite deliberately crafted so as not to make the case law of the European Court of Human Rights binding on domestic courts. It does require those courts to take that case law into account. That can be contrasted with the binding effect of the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union in Section 3 of the European Communities Act 1972. And of course, for the time being, this country remains a member of the European Union and that remains part of our law. The second point I'm going to make is that accordingly, when the Human Rights Act was introduced, it was envisaged by some commentators that it would develop into a domestic Bill of Rights. In other words, not simply be an Act of Parliament which gave effect in domestic law to an international treaty. 
I'll give you a couple of quotes from judges. Uh, soon after the Human Rights Act came into force in the year 2000, uh, this is Lord Justice Laws in the Court of Appeal in 2002 in Runa Begum and Tower Hamlets. I think it important, he said, to have in mind that the court's task under the Human Rights Act in this context is not simply to add on the Strasbourg learning to the corpus of English law as if it were a compulsory adjunct taken from an alien source, but to develop a municipal law of human rights by the incremental method of the common law, case by case, taking account of the Strasbourg jurisprudence as Section 2 of the Human Rights Act enjoins us to do. And in similar vein, in Aston Cantlow, at first instance, that later on the case went to the House of Lords, but at first instance, Sir Andrew Morritt, the Vice-Chancellor in the High Court, said, our task is not to cast around in the European Human Rights Reports like black-letter lawyers seeking clues. In the light of Section 2, it is to draw out the broad principles which animate the Convention. My third point is that, however, it quickly became apparent that the case law in Strasbourg was likely to be regarded as a flaw, a flaw beneath which domestic protection of human rights should not fall. Otherwise, cases would still go to Strasbourg. And one of the main functions of the Human Rights Act had been, in the language of the time, to bring rights home, in other words, to make them more effective in the domestic legal order, and avoid the need for people to go to Strasbourg. This then led to what has become known as the Ulla Principle, or the Mirror Principle. In Ulla, in 2004, Lord Bingham said this, It is, of course, open to member states to provide for rights more generous than those guaranteed by the Convention, but such provision should not be the product of interpretation of the Convention by national courts, since the meaning of the Convention should be uniform throughout the state's party to it. And in a very famous sentence, he said this, the duty of national courts is to keep pace with the Strasbourg jurisprudence as it evolves over time. No more, but certainly no less. Now that phrase, certainly no less, was taken to mean Strasbourg provides the floor of protection. My fourth point is this. This later became refined in Alskany in 2007, where Lord Brown said, after quoting Lord Bingham, I would respectfully suggest that that last sentence could as well have ended, no less, but certainly no more. He continued, there seems to me a greater danger in the National Court construing the Convention too generously in favour of an applicant than in construing it too narrowly. In the former event, the mistake will necessarily stand. The member state cannot itself go to Strasbourg to have it corrected. In the latter event, however, where convention rights have been denied by too narrow a construction, the aggrieved individual can have the decision corrected in Strasbourg. My fifth point is that, in general, the reception of the Strasbourg case law into domestic law, I would suggest, has been seamless and unproblematic to the extent that it has now become routine. However, there have been exceptions in which the domestic courts have not been prepared to follow a decision of the European Court of Human Rights. But this was because it was felt to be based on a misunderstanding of the domestic position, rather than a fundamental refusal to comply with the decision of the Strasbourg Court. And there are two areas in particular where this has occurred. The first is the reception of hearsay evidence in criminal trials. And the second is sentencing, particularly where a whole life order is imposed for the offence of murder. I'll take each of those in turn. In a case called Horncastle in 2009, uh, Lord Phillips 
suggested that the requirement to take into account the Strasbourg jurisprudence will normally result in the domestic court applying principles that are clearly established by the Strasbourg court. There will, however, be rare occasions where the domestic court has concerns as to whether a decision of the Strasbourg court sufficiently appreciates or accommodates particular aspects of our domestic process. In such circumstances, it is open to the domestic court to decline to follow the Strasbourg decision, giving reasons for adopting this course. This is likely to give the Strasbourg court the opportunity to reconsider the, the particular aspect of the decision so that there takes place what may prove to be a valuable dialogue. It's interesting, there is a judicial use of the very word that I think is going to feature uh, frequently at today's conference, a valuable dialogue between the domestic court and the Strasbourg court. And what happened in that case was that Bourne Castle uh, was decided after the section of the Strasbourg Court had decided a case called al Khawaja and Tahiri. That case then went to the Grand Chamber, which took account of what the House of Lords had said in Horncastle and modified the ruling in Strasbourg. Uh, they agreed that a conviction based solely or decisively on the statement of an absent witness would not automatically result in a breach of Article 6 of the Convention However, there would still be a breach of the defendant's rights unless there were counterbalancing factors, including strong procedural safeguards to compensate for the difficulties caused to the defence. But they took into account the dialogue which the House of Lords had entered into with them. The uh, <coughs> standard which has been set by the UK Supreme Court to depart from Strasbourg authority is a very high one. In one of the prisoner voting cases, Chester, in 2013, Lord Mance said that Strasbourg's decision would have to relate to some truly fundamental principle of our law or some most egregious oversight or misunderstanding before it could be appropriate for this court to contemplate an outright refusal to follow Strasbourg authority at the Grand Chamber level. The second area I've mentioned is whole life orders. And the case law there developed in this way, in Winter and others, the Strasbourg Court held that the UK's imposition of whole life orders for uh, three convicted murderers was in violation of Article 3. The court said that only irreducible life sentences in both a de facto and de jure sense offended Article 3, that is, those cases in which there was neither prospect of release nor the possibility of review. In a subsequent case in the Court of Appeal, the Crown against Newell, the Court of Appeal of England and Wales said that Strasbourg had misunderstood the nature of the UK regime, which it considered was consistent with the principles as articulated in Winter. Uh, the Court clarified what the position was in domestic law. Subsequently, in a case called Hutchinson against United Kingdom, the Grand Chamber held the decision in Newell had helpfully clarified the domestic position, and that clarification dispelled the view that the UK position was incompatible <coughs> with the ECHR. So again, a process of healthy dialogue. My sixth point is this. The domestic courts have also had to develop principles as to what they should do when faced with a conflict between a decision of our own highest court previously the House of Lords, now since 2009 the Supreme Court, and a decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Usually that will be a later decision, because the earlier ones will probably be taken into account in the earlier case law. In essence, the position that has been reached in domestic law is that our doctrine of precedent still applies, but such a conflict may lead to the Supreme Court revising its own case law to catch up with Strasbourg. And again, if I may respectfully say so, this has now become really quite routine. Earlier this year, I gave judgment with Mrs. Justice Farby in a case called DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions against Ziegler, which is a case about freedom of assembly on the highway. And I said, we would respectfully suggest that even the decision of the House of Lords in DPP and Margaret Jones which is a case decided in 1999, 
now needs to be treated with some caution. The decision was given in 1999 before the coming into force of the Human Rights Act. My seventh and final point is this. So far I've only spoken about the case law from Strasbourg. I should say a word about case law from other jurisdictions, which are not actually about the ECHR. There is nothing in the Human Rights Act which, pre which prevents domestic courts in this country from taking such case law into account. Our courts often do so, while noting that care needs to be taken because the human rights instrument concerned may be very different from the ECHR. In one example is the Canadian Charter doesn't contain the right to private property. That said, we do often refer to decisions of the Canadian courts on the Charter uh, on freedom of religion. I cited the Supreme Court of Canada recently in a case concerning Article 9 of the ECHR. And, and one of the most famous examples, perhaps, of this happening in the case of jurisprudence from the US Supreme Court is the Belmarsh case, A and Secretary of State for the Home Department in 2004, where Lord Bing <coughs> famously relied on the judgment of Justice Jackson in the US Supreme Court case of Railway Express Agency versus New York in 1949. That was on the importance of the principle of equal treatment. And arguably, the American jurisprudence was actually stronger and clearer on this than the jurisprudence on Article 14 of the ECHR tends to be. So, to conclude, if I may, I would suggest that uh, in this field, at least, and it may be in the context of today's overall conference, a relatively small corner of the field, but nevertheless in this part of the field at least, uh, there is reason for optimism, because I would suggest that the relationship which has developed between the case law of the domestic courts under the Human Rights Act and the Strasbourg jurisprudence is a relationship of harmony, uh, of mutual respect uh, and of dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabindra. If I hope not too indiscreet to say that you'd have made an excellent Greek lecturer. Um, <laughs> 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 it's a uh, disjuncture also this is the picture we have of this harmonious, well functional relationship which of course extends also to the implementation of the UK, with the notable exception of prisoner voting rights, that the UK has an exemplary record of implementing Strasbourg judgments, and indeed there are now very few such judgments against the UK. So what a disjuncture between this actually very well-functioning relationship on all levels and the uh, often shameful rhetoric that characterises our debate about the ECHR. Uh, perhaps we can pick on that up uh, later. But first, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, good morning to all of you. Um, I'd like to express how very grateful I am to be participating today in this discussion. Um, thank you to the conveners, the organizers, and the sponsor. Now, today I'll be talking to you about impact and compliance within the inter-American system, and have more or less structured the presentation as follows. So first, I'd like to start by making the argument that implementation and compliance are very important matters, but that it makes no sense to address them within the broader framework of a tribunal's impact, so we're not losing sight of, of the impact. Second, and then moving on specifically to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, I'd like to explain why this court generally risks appearing less effective in order to have a greater impact. And then finally, I'll walk you through, through some of the elements that I think have been important for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to be able to play a role that is more oriented towards impact than strict compliance. So, why should we look at implementation and compliance within the broader framework of impact? For me, this all started with um, a burning desire to prove my European colleagues at the Max Planck Institute wrong. 
Um, things have changed quite a while, but back then, when I started working on the Inter-American Court, I was very excited about it. Um, and the first thing that they would tell me, they would tell me, and this was quite annoying, was that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights was a mere paper tiger. So they knew very little about the court, but they did know that its compliance rates were dismal. Now, um, R, this was uh, many years before books like Impact and Compliance, so I really had my work cut out for me. Especially uh, because, like many of you, I'm a lawyer by training. And this um, leads to certain professional deformations. What are these? We have a tendency to boil down legal authority to a very simple command and obey logic that takes place between two parties. So we have, on the one hand, the authority giving the order, the Inter-American of Human Rights, for example. And then on the other hand, we have the addressee of, of this order, uh, a state authority that has to implement a certain measure. Then we also equate impact with effectiveness, so, and which is nothing more than strict compliance with specific orders in a reasonable period of time. And we have a tendency to come to the conclusion that something has gone horribly wrong when these assumptions are not met. And the problem with these beliefs is that they leave us with some massive blind spots. Um, it's also probably why some of the most interesting research on the matter is not conducted by legal scholars but by social scientists. What are these blind spots? We fail to see that the matter of human rights compliance or implementation often depends on a much larger number of actors than just the court and the direct addressee of the order. We lose sight of the fact that human rights are embedded in political and social processes, struggles even. Just because we have created a legal language to give form to these claims does not mean that we have fully extracted the underlying matters from other social fields. Also, the last blind spot I would uh, like to point out is that it might make us too quick to dismiss the importance or to downplay the role that a court or a legal institution play or may play when the command and obey logic is not an internalized or normalized routine. So, how does this relate to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights? To my annoyance, my colleagues were not wrong to point out that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has some compliance or implementation problems. Let's call them challenges. <laughs> and um, they're quite right that it's an that it, that it's an that it's an important um, issue. But they were wrong to dismiss the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as a mere paper, uh, mere paper tiger, because on matters of impact, its track record is surprisingly good. So, there are several reasons why the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has these compliance problems. Some are due to the context in which it operates, and some of these are self-inflicted. So, what about, what about the context in which it operates? Um, I think we heard about this already. Latin America has some, very, has some very violent places. There are alarming levels of inequality, relatively weak institutions, and some very uneven application of the law. And then you have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights so-called self-inflicted challenges, which I don't think are really that problematic. Um, there is no judgment attached to, to this descriptor. And then the clearest one of this is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights reparation practice. So. <clears throat> This has already been the case. Anyone doing senior future research and implementation has to take into account how much more demanding the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is in comparison, for example, to the European Court of Human Rights vis-a-vis -vis states. So a declarative judgment with a mere monetary compensation is an extremely rare phenomenon in the Inter-American system. Most judgments rendered have contained very long lists of measures for states to implement, both measures that are specific to the violations sort of analyzed in the case, as well as measures to change the underlying situation that gave rise to the human rights violations. This is what the court calls uh, guarantees of non-repetition. <coughs> These are obviously more difficult to implement, involve a lot more actors, and necessarily take more time. So, um, 
perhaps just um, a, a couple of examples from um, from a case um, against Mexico, the Cottonfield case of the murdered women of Ciudad Juarez. For example, Mexico was ordered to change its protocols, manuals, and prosecutorial practice to incorporate a gender perspective when violent crimes against women are at stake. It also needed to change its practice regarding the investigation of disappearances of women, initiating ex officio practices, coordinating between security agents. It needed to create a database of all disappeared women with DNA samples of the next and of kin in order to identify them uh, if bodies turned up. It needed to hold training programs for public officials on gender perspective or discrimination and violence against women. And it needed to create and implement an educational program for the general population of the state of Chihuahua regarding the problem of violence against women. All of this in addition to the specific violations that it needed to uh, the specific preparations that it needed to investigate, criminally investigate, the matter of those women that had come to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, give, them, give their next of kin psychological help, hold public acts of apology, etc. So clearly, had the Inter-American Court of Human Rights stuck to a more minimalist approach, um, its compliance rate would be better. Then again, would that be a better court? Um, I generally don't think so. So, um, now let's move on um, to the next issue. So why would a court risk appearing less effective in order to have a greater impact? And um, here I see sort of two reasons why the court has done this. Some of, the, some of these are practical and some of these are related to the sort of the sense of mission that it has developed. Um, let's get the practical ones quickly out of the way. Um, the court has a really small budget um, it only gets about uh, 20 cases a year that it can decide on. Basically, it knows that every case that it gets, there are hundreds of it that are quite similar and they will never reach the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So it needs to make every single judgment matter. This is in contrast to the European Court of Human Rights, who has, which has hundreds of cases um, a year. So that's the practical part. Then you have the one that is more uh, related to the sense of, of, of mission that it has developed. Now, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights does not see, see, see itself as a human rights fine-tuner. So it doesn't deal with sporadic, discrete violations of states that are highly committed to the cause of human rights. Um, and most often than not, the violations that come to it are structural in nature. So in this particular context, the court has chosen to play a transformative role. And here I'm taking, um, I'm taking this concept, uh, this was developed by Carl Clare when he was describing South African constitutionalism after apartheid. So the court has embarked on a long-term project aimed at inducing large-scale social change through processes which are grounded in law. So this long-term project, build a functioning human rights field, hedge power through law, and give human rights effectiveness by supporting institutions and actors at the national level that can make this happen. And by taking on such a role, which is actually pretty grandiose and, 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 and maybe even a dangerous one, the Inter-American Code of Human Rights has been willing to sacrifice some of its effectiveness, some of its compliance effectiveness, for a more substantial long-term payoff. Now, why was the Inter-American Court of Human Rights able to take on such a role? Clearly, this is not something that a court can just wake up from one day to the next and decide, okay, this is what, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so I think there are especially two things that have allowed the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to do this. Uh, one, of this one of these is the existence of a very, very rich and dense ecosystem of actors that regularly engage with it to deal with human rights matters. And the second one is the existence, and this is particularly important for the legal, strictly legal community, the existence of bridges or openings between national and international law. Um, and these two things, the ecosystem and the legal openings, were also not spontaneous developments, but rather a product of the region's recent history. On the one hand, the 
experience of dictatorships, especially in the Southern Cone, but also in Central America, and then what happened afterwards, the third wave of democratization in Latin America. Why? The experience of dictatorships basically gave birth to the human rights movement in the region. You can basically date the beginning of human rights organizations to the 11th of September of 1973, that is Pinochet's coup on Salvador Allende. And these human rights organizations came on to take so much social relevance. They were central in denouncing violence, and they created a symbolic, symbolic, okay, it's a very good relationship with the condition, basically. So they really needed each other. Uh, because without the information that the, com the commission got from these, um, from these organizations on the ground, it would have not been able to denounce states in the way it did. And it would have been completely irrelevant, as it mostly was before then. Also, without the credence that the commission gave these organizations, they would have also been crushed by these dictatorial states. When democratization came around, this ecosystem exploded in terms of the numbers of actors participating in it. So on the one hand, you have even more human rights organizations that crop up in a much better environment for um, mobilization, litigation, etc. Then you have to start the academic interest in the work of these organs, a series of research networks, specialized publication, moot courts, law clinics, etc. Uh, since cooperating with the inter-American system became synonymous with aiding the improvement of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, you have a whole bunch of donor countries and political foundations based on third states that also came on board and participated in the project. And more important still, even a lot, lot more important than that, a series of constitutional reforms expanded the number of human rights-oriented actors within the state. So all of a sudden, we have constitutional courts, ombudspersons, newly retrained national prosecutors, national human rights agencies, etc. So the state was disaggregated. We no longer have this kind of like violent monolithic entity, but you have a lot of different actors, and many of them do respond to the human rights law. And these democratization processes also built these bridges between national constitutional law and international human rights law. International human rights law became part of the domestic constitutional bloc. So basically it has a place of privilege within the domestic legal order. And not only that, but interpretation clauses have been incorporated into the constitution that allow international law to trump national law when the norm in question is more favorable to the human person. So let's, let's recap then. So the Inter-American Court has taken on kind of like this transformative role, but it cannot do it on its own. So this is basically a joint or common endeavor for all actors that participate in the human rights field. Um, and this, I think, is basically what the lesson should be now for my European colleagues who unfortunately are now also experiencing um, what it is sort of to work with human rights in hard times because they used to take it for granted that everything was going to keep on being uh, great. So, of course, we should not lose sight of compliance and implementation. <coughs> of course, we should not give up on, on these matters. But we should also not despair or give in to helplessness because human rights are essentially a struggle. And although we should insist on the juridical normality of human rights compliance, we should also take our own sort of role, role, political role in the struggle and contribute to it. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kimberla. It's a shame your colleagues from Max Planck Institute are not here to eat some humble pie. Um, <laughs> thank you also for another, actually, a second uh, optimistic, I would say, presentation, actually, of um, continuing the theme from the previous panel. So, uh, no pressure on Anne to continue this uh, sunny discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Just going to try to bring up my presentation. All right.
right. Thank you very much, Alice, for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to inject a civil society perspective into today, today's panel. We have, uh, or you have kindly disaggregated the state for us, and I'm going to throw some, some light on the role of one particular state actor, namely NGOs, in specifically the implementation of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I will take you through a case example from Romania to illustrate the number of lessons that we have learned both as part of the Human Rights Law Implementation Project and as part of EIN's engagement with members and partners in, uh, across European um, Council of Europe member states. I divided my presentation into three parts. In the first, I will use said case example to sort of set out what ideal type NGO involvement in implementation work would look like. The second tries to explore to what extent current practice matches this ambition, and I would conclude by presenting a few recommendations as to how civil society um, engagement in implementation can be facilitated. The picture you see on the screen was taken after a Pride event in 2006 in the capital of Romania, in Bucharest. Um, and it shows how a, a few people are being attacked uh, by, by, the, by a group of homophobic uh, persons who were also um, shouting homophobic slurs at them. The event photographer happened to be traveling on the same metro car, so he was able to, to take these pictures. But despite the photographic evidence, this incident was never properly investigated. And even more so, the incident was um, reflective of widespread impunity for homophobic violence in Romania. A Romanian NGO called Accept reached out to domestic actors um, the minute, basically, the judgment from the European Court of Human Rights was issued, tried to work with them to identify the measures that needed to be taken to prevent recurrence of the situation. We call this general measures but it's essentially guarantees of non-repetition if we uh, draw the parallel to the inter-American system. ACCEPT also sent a communication under so-called Rule 9, a so-called Rule 9 communication to the Committee of Ministers, the political body that supervises the implementation of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. And it pointed out prevailing shortcomings in um, investigations of hate crimes, and it called for a number of measures to be adopted, including <coughs> data collection on homophobic hate crimes and training for police and legal professionals. However, accepts um, demands basically seem to fall on deaf ears among the authorities. They paid lip service to them, but then still submitted an action plan. This is a document states are supposed to submit to the Committee of Ministers, setting out the measures they intend to, to uh, adopt to comply with the ruling, in which it said, <coughs> nothing to see here, we've done all we need to do, so move on, you can close this case file. Um, Abject responded with a second submission to the Committee of Ministers demonstrating that all the measures that the state claimed to have taken, data, data collection and training of officials, were wholly inadequate. In fact, they didn't, the trainings, for example, didn't even cover hate crimes. And the Council of Europe Department for the Execution of Judgments, which services the Committee of Ministers, broadly agreed with Accept's submission and demanded the proposals from the Romanian state. And this is when things really started to look up. Um, a, a working group was, an interministerial working group was set up, of which Accept was a member, and it met several times throughout 2017. The victims also had a chance, and this uh, was reported to be very, very important for them, to meet with government officials in order to explain to them how the incident still impacted them, even 10 years after it, it had happened. A training manual was produced by the, by, the, uh, by the police, and the prosecutors developed a methodology for data collection. In September 2018, the Romanian government then submitted a new action plan uh, taking up the NGO's main proposals. I'll cut this anecdote short here by noting that unfortunately things have not progressed as uh, linearly, well, in a linear fashion, as, as Rachel has alluded to this morning. Um, there, there remain uh, incompatibilities with the practice of the Romanian authorities and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. But on a positive note, international supervision of the implementation of this case is ongoing. <coughs> Why did I select this case example then if it's not a clear-cut implementation success story? Um, it would appear that there should be 
thousands of these implementation success stories because just last year, for example, the Committee of Ministers closed the examination of 2,700 cases. And a former uh, or a senior official within the Council of Europe whom we interviewed as part of the Human Rights Law Implementation Project told us that it's pretty miraculous that more, way above 1,000 cases are closed each year. But I would argue that if you want to determine how influential Strasbourg Court judgments are, we need to prove that reforms not merely coincided with, but that they were triggered by the ECTHR's ruling. But determining that causality is really, really hard to do as we learned the hard way at the, uh, at the European uh, uh, Human Rights and Limitation Project. Um, so it's especially in regard to systemic uh, problems as opposed to specific individual measures of the payment of sums, which are quite easily to measure, or easy to measure. Even the closure of a case, that is the, the termination of international supervision by the Committee of Ministers, we argue, is not a perfect indicator to argue that the behavior was actually triggered by, by the ruling. And in fact, the Committee of Ministers is pretty agnostic to the drivers for reforms. So what you have to do instead is to trace the path between the judgment and subsequent action. And doing that in this particular case from Romania, called MC and AC against Romania, revealed that um, the judgment really was a decisive spur for at least some action. So a first general conclusion we can draw is that judgments can in fact trigger reforms, but that they work in subtle ways that are not always straightforward to identify. The case example also underscores the importance of civil society actors picking up the judgments and using them to push for implementation domestically and through the supranational system. Had the Romanian NGO ACCEPT not done that, um, the progress we have seen, even as little as it may be, would likely not have occurred. So there are three reasons I would suggest that for NGOs to advocate for the, judge, for the implementation of ECTHR judgments. The first is the opportunity to help determine the scope of reform and the corresponding supervision. Where they engage early on, identifying the relevant problems and uh, required remedial actions, NGOs can really sort of set the framework for supervision. And this is, of course, incredibly important in the European system where, as we have heard, the judgments from the European Court of Human Rights are, as a rule, declaratory only and not specific on remedies or reparations. Secondly, MC and AC also shows that NGOs can contribute to setting reforms in motion. It was the combination of domestic advocacy, meeting with the authorities, working with the police, etc., etc., while at the same time lamenting the lack of progress at the international level that really pushed things forward at the domestic level. And this injection of impetus is extremely <coughs> important, not only with, with regard to new judgments, but also with regard to older judgments that, for one reason or another, might have sort of slipped under the radar in the 6,000 cases that are currently pending implementation. And um, thirdly and finally, I would uh, impress upon NGOs to get involved to, event, to prevent premature closure of the supervision. This point is admittedly not ideally uh, reflected in, in the case example I gave, but the fact that the Romanian government put forward an action plan basically saying no more measures are needed does show that governments are not always very good in uh, providing accurate information to the Committee of Ministers. And one point underlying all three of these arguments is um, that NGO involvement uh, is, is to avoid premature closure of a case, that is already an achievement, let's say. But it's very hard to really measure what a success implementation success story would look like. And we say implementation success or successful advocacy for implementation comes in at least four different uh, main ways. On the most basic level uh, of the pyramid, in the, in the bottom layer, um, it can be deemed a success when the supervisory body declares that the changes requested by an NGO are indeed necessary. The second level is engagement of the national authorities on the need to adopt certain measures. And another level above is adoption, by which we mean that the changes proposed by the NGO are in fact recognized by the state authorities and plans are put in motion to bring them about. And of course, at the top of the pyramid, we obviously want to see the changes fully implemented. 
For NGOs, this means that they should have realistic expectations as to what it is that they can achieve at any point in time, which may, with, with windows of opportunity opening and, um, and closing, change over, over time. And finally, the MC and AC case illustrates how important it is for NGOs to keep on pushing for implementation. Windows of opportunity, as I said, might open and close at the domestic level, but they are always open at the European level. So they can submit as many submissions to the Committee of Ministers as they want, for example, or as they, as they need. International supervision continues until the time that the Committee of Ministers is satisfied that all measures have been taken, and this is a key feature that NGOs can really exploit. All of this uh, leaves us with this ideal type scenario, then, where NGO involvement aimed at effective ECTHR judgment implementation. A starts early, specifically already at the litigation stage. It comes in the form of repeated engagement, not least because, as we have heard from Rachel this morning, um, implementation is a, an iterative process, the end point of which might only become apparent once yeah, we're a couple of years down the road, or at least a couple of months down the road, and once a number of actors have gotten their say in how the remedies should be designed, it would be built on coalitions among a variety of actors, as we've just heard, and it would be conducted domestically and through the Strasbourg system. Time for a reality check, then. Are we even close to that ideal type NGO involvement? It seems that... Um, well, domestic advocacy for a judgment implementation is really still in its infancy. Even litigating organizations, organizations engaging in strategic litigation, do not always appropriately follow up on their cases. They would use them in ongoing domestic um, litigation or international litigation, but they don't really use other domestic advocacy avenues, such as, by exa for example, by, by offering to contribute to the design of an action plan. And through the Strasbourg system as well, the level of NGO engagement with the judgment execution process is far from satisfactory. NGOs currently only intervene in 5% of so-called leading cases. Those are cases which signal a systemic or a structural problem and uh, necessitate the adoption of, of general measures. Um, last year, there has even been a drop in the number of so-called Rule 9 submissions by NGOs and NHRIs uh, to the Committee of Ministers for the second time in a row. Things are looking up a bit this year, I'm <coughs> pleased to say, but um, the challenge is real and the challenge is exacerbated by the fact that many NGOs only intervene once. This low level of NGO involvement is a real problem if we recall both the benefits of NGO input and it's at the same time have regard to the thousands of unimplemented cases that are sitting in Strasbourg, many of which have been pending for more than 5, 10 or even 15 years. Um, of the leading judgments handed down by the European Court of Human Rights in the last 10 years, almost 45% still remain, remain open, so pending full implementation. And for the cases that are implemented, implementation is taking longer and longer. So the question then is, where NGOs have failed to engage, what are the obstacles? Civil society interviewees for the Human Rights Law Implementation Project um, point to a number of factors that have imp had, had impeded them from engaging in the judgment execution process. Most prominent of which was the lack of knowledge about the follow-up process and how they could get involved. They were almost apologetic, correct me if I'm wrong, when we asked them, for example, have you submitted a Rule 9? And they said, we simply didn't know we could. But at the same time, they almost all of them went on to saying, well, we've never been asked. We didn't know we could, and we've never been asked by the Committee of Ministers. NGOs also admitted that implementation work is quite tedious, it's time consuming, and it's often, uh, it often involves getting over some, some language barriers because submissions have to be made in English or French. Um, and they pointed out that money is lacking. Oftentimes, funders do not uh, appear to have grasped the importance of funding implementation work, even though it is basically the natural continuation of litigation, I would say. And last, but certainly not least, there also appears to be um, uncertainty about, about how to make a Rule 9 submission to the Committee of Ministers impactful, especially if we're lacking hard data, and how to prove the impact of these submissions. This leads us directly to the final point of my presentation. I would like to leave you with um, the suggestion that making 
re making NGO, greater NGO involvement in implementation in a reality really necessitates a concerted effort by all of us in this room, including academics that teach in the CHR module, for example, and whose students might one day go on to, to working in NGOs, so they should know all this stuff. Um, <laughs> among NGOs, a better understanding must be fostered of the opportunities presented by engaging in the judgment implementation process. And here are just a few suggestions. When an NGO wants to venture into advocacy for a judgment implementation for the first time, they really need to choose their battles. They should, for example, start by matching their actual ongoing work with the work of the Committee of Ministers and mapping the pending leading cases against their own country may very, very often reveal that they already conduct advocacy on a specific theme that the Committee of Ministers just happens to also look into and that they have simply so far failed to connect the dots. So there is definitely an entry point to make sure that these judgments don't, do not become an additional burden but an additional lever to pull for these NGOs. My second point concerns the need to mobilize other civil society actors. And again, this builds on what Jimena said. Um, better coordinating among NGOs and uh, involving other domestic advocacy um, constituencies to form advocacy alliances is crucially important. And of course, it necessitates someone to, to pick up the, the baton and, and, uh, and, and go for it and display leadership. And EIN, the European Implementation uh, Network, we sort of provide in, uh, we provide support for our members and partners to become these implementation hubs at the domestic level. And last but not least, in many countries there also at is there is also at least some opening for engaging with the domestic authorities. There are allies in Parliament, as we've heard from Mario this morning. There are allies within the police, etc. The challenge is to find these and to work with them effectively and get them on board. Finally, the relevant Council of Europe institutions could do more to facilitate civil society engagement. It must be acknowledged, though, that over the course of the past few years, the Department for the Execution of Judgments that services the Committee of Ministers has become a lot more open, a lot more welcoming to input from civil society. We can see that in our everyday work at EIN. Um, but still, more can and should be done. On the most basic level, this can take the form of the DEJ holding meetings with civil society representatives as a matter of routine whenever they visit a country. Secondly, one could also envisage the introduction of a requirement that states, when submitting an action plan or action report, uh, report on the involvement of civil society actors in the design of the remedies and the implementation of these remedial <coughs> measures. This would at least normalize um, implementation as, a, as, an inclusive, as an inclusive endeavor. A third important point um, would be for the DJ to be proactive in eliciting comments from civil society organizations, at least when it knows that they have an interest in and expertise in a certain field because they litigate the case, because they intervened as a third party in the proceedings before the court, or because they already submitted a rule line in this specific, specific case. Two final points. If the Committee of Ministers wants to encourage greater interaction between member states and civil society actors for the purposes of implementation of judgments, and there is a barrier of participation by NGOs due to the impossibility of them getting funding, which is in part, of course, um, due to the fact that they cannot prove <coughs> impact given the intransparent nature of the whole process, then surely it is incumbent on the Committee of Min uh, on, on the Council of Europe to do two things. A, for the Department for the Execution of Judgments to provide feedback on the impact of the judgment of the Rule 9 submissions that have been made, and for the Council of Europe to provide funding for implementation work. The Russia related by financial crisis might be over soon, so we hope, um, and we submit that in funding for implementation work should be included in the next phase of the Convention reform process. And this way, we can all work together to truly make the off sited shared responsibility for implementation of reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I think that was a really optimistic presentation, at least uh, scope, uh, if, if unfulfilled uh, potential um, being talked about. So um, thank you very much to all three of our speakers. You've left us with lots of uh, 
food for thought and some connecting themes, perhaps. The, the, I like your analogy of the ecosystem and factors in the increasingly dense, as you said, uh, extensive ecosystem, both at the domestic level and the supranational level, <clears throat> with potential for dialogue and collaboration, both, as it were, horizontally and vertically. Um, creating also then the potential for courts themselves, or in the, in the European case also the Committee of Ministers as the political body, to become, or indeed they are already strategic actors, this, this conscious building of what is often called complex constituencies. Um, the capacity of those different bodies to do that, you've mentioned that within this ecosystem of course are also funding bodies or those with the resources that might help, help make this happen. Um, and I think also your presentation, Kim and I, from a more academic point of view, showed the value of this interdisciplinarity and particularly the injection of political science and social science um, scholarship into what was previously a, a territory populated only by lawyers. So um, I'm sure there are many more themes too. So let's open it up to see who would like to ask what. Do you want to introduce yourselves briefly, make a short contribution or ask a question? And perhaps I'll take two or three <coughs> to begin with. Yeah. I don't have a microphone, do we? But hopefully we can hear. I'm happy to project my voice. Please you're, you're able to hear me OK. Um, yeah. I'm Jonathan Metzer, I'm a barrister who does public law in London. Uh, and uh, I think there's been present in all the talks that we've had, including the really considered introductions, has been discussion about whether or not there is something of a crisis in, in terms of human rights in the question of whether or not there is a sort of reaction uh, and, a, and a more a tendency away from accepting the legitimacy of human rights and how they're being interpreted. And I think in Lord Sumption's Reef lectures, we've sort of seen that given voice uh, in terms of how that's been analysed by which what I think is described as the democratic critique of human rights. Uh, so I, I wonder, do you think that that demands an answer? And if you do, how would you, or how would you say it can be answered by people who feel, broadly speaking, human rights are an important thing which should be defended? Um, is that question directed at anybody in particular, or...? Uh, well, I'm interested in the views of all three members all of the panel. Great, thank you very much. Should we take another one or two? Yeah. Yes. Me. Uh, Siki Kanan, a public prosecutor from Nepal. Uh, I have one query. Uh, regarding the uh, human rights in Nepal, uh, Nepal uh, most of the countries who made the constitution uh, recently years they make the uh, uh, they incorporated the human rights in funda as a fundamental rights most most of them are uh, also incorporated uh, like the rights relating to the economic and social right uh, like uh, right to food uh, right to residence right to clean environment right to health rights such, such things which rights uh, basically related to the uh, economics. The state needs the high resources to implement, implement such rights. Uh, the um, organizations of the advocacy forums from international organizations, they basically focus on the broadening or widening the human rights instead to the vertical intern, uh, they are not focusing to how to entrench them, uh, but they uh, try to burning or uh, horizontal burning. Uh, I think uh, it is need to, instead of the vertical uh, or horizontal burning to uh, human rights, it needs to the vertical strengthening. Uh, which state uh, resources or economic resources needs? How to implement it such uh, rights regarding uh, relating to the uh, socio-economic uh, right? How to implement it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this isn't really a, a question; it's more a, an observation. That obviously, for those of us who are on the European Committee of Social Rights, we dream of having a body that follows up on enforcement because we are at the moment uh, the committee administers roles with regards to uh, decisions of the European Committee is to pass a resolution 
Whereas when it comes to following up implementation with states, it's down to the committee itself, which is obviously demanding in terms of resources and very challenging given the profile of the committee and perhaps the lack of awareness, not just on the part of civil society more broadly, but to reflect what uh, Shimena was saying earlier, this, or uh, sorry, Anna, about knowing about how to interact with the committee in order to follow up around implementation or non-implementation. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I started off by making a joke, but it's a very serious issue when one does not have, when there is issues around the resources available for implementation, even within the monitoring body itself. Thank you, yes, and, and indeed our project has also picked up a lot on the serious under-resourcing of implementation work within the bodies themselves, actually including the execution department, although one may, may think that's the kind of Rolls-Royce body. Uh, it's bigger, certainly, but then you think how many cases there are actually the ratio of, of uh, people in the execution department is, what was it, 1 to 150? Exactly. The, 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 the execution department currently has 39 lawyers, most of whom are seconded, or, or, or most of whom are uh, on temporary contracts or seconded from governments, and they deal with some 6,000 cases. Um, so thank you, we've got three. Should I just take one more question? Yeah. Yeah. My question regarding the NGO's role, because you will see that the lot of countries are not happy with their role. Their interference in the domestic matters. And uh, in terms, if I will illustrate an example of Asian countries. You will see India, Pakistan, and there are so many countries. They are not happy with the role of NGO and even in the WTO you will find that uh, uh, the, the countries are not happy with the NGO reports and they, they raise their voice against the NGO that whenever the court proceeding or NGO, uh, WTO proceeding has been going on, NGO are not allowed to submit their reports. So in this situation where the lot of states are not happy with the NGO role, how the NGO will work in these circumstances and how they will strengthen their role, they will rise their voice and they will persuade the people to come out and to speak with them. That's a really important question because uh, we are uh, just saying human rights, human rights, but in terms of human rights enforcement, the track record is very poor, unfortunately. Thank you. Great. Um, Thanks for those questions. We'll have time for plenty more. So the first one was the, the, the so-called crisis of legitimacy or the, the, the democratic critique. Um, Ravinder, I know that in 97, I think you published a book called The Future of Human Rights in the UK, which very presciently foresaw and indeed began to address the democratic critique. I don't know if you want to expand upon that first. Yes, thank you. Uh... Yes, I think, I think that little book is still in print. Uh, <laughs> there's an essay in it which addresses the so-called myth of judicial supremacism. And, and that's really when I began my thinking about how to reconcile the protection of fundamental human rights with, of course, a profound commitment to democracy. Uh, that journey then continues, if you're interested, there's a chapter in a book published in 2000 on the eve of the coming into force of the Human Rights Act, edited, I think, by Jonathan Cooper. Uh, my chapter was called The Place of the Human Rights Act in a Democratic Society. And then, of course, with the advantage of 18 years of case law under the HRA, last September I gave a lecture at the University of Montreal, which asked the question, what is a democratic society? And one of the things that I quoted in that lecture is what I believe to be one of the most profound sentences ever uttered by a judge. In 2004, in a case called Gaydan and Godi Mendoza, at paragraph 132, Lady Hale says, democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. I think it's an enormously profound sentence and needs to be unpacked for a moment. But what she meant by that, I think, was that if we value democracy, it is for a more fundamental reason which underlies the concept of democracy, which is that all human beings are born free and equal. That's how the, uh, the Universal Declaration begins in Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and right. That's why we believe in universal suffrage. 
It's a relatively new development, even in Western Europe. Uh, it's less than 100 years old in the UK, the idea that every adult human being should have the vote. And note, of course, that in a democracy like the UK, everyone has only one vote. You could argue, in principle, and historically this used to be the case, some people had more than one vote because they were thought to be more equal than others. Uh, they, were, they were said to be more educated or they held more property. We don't believe in that. We believe in a democracy that everyone is equal. And I think that's what Lady Hale was getting at when she says in Gaeta that democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. Now, if you believe in that, then I think that certain things follow, including the proposition that simply because the majority wills something does not mean that it must prevail. Another point I would make is that if you value democracy, then you have to have some institutions to protect democracy itself. So what if Parliament were, for example, to vote to abolish elections? Or to disenfranchise some sector of the population? What if Parliament were to prohibit freedom of expression? How would free elections actually be possible and effective? So I think that these are some of the deeper questions that time doesn't permit for us to discuss them fully now. But uh, as I say, I have tried to put in writing some of my thoughts, which I hope will give you some of the answers uh, to some of what's said by way of the democratic procedure. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to come back on that, or do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, I think um, I'd like to, to address a bit the comments of, of the Jonathan and the Jonathan Wright on, on the democratic critique of rights. And you're probably not thinking about the Latin American context when you make this comment, but I'd like to bring that a bit to the fore. So, so normally, if you're talking about the democratic uh, critique of rights, first of all, we need to know who is raising this critique, so, first of all. So if, if we're talking about only the executive or a small elite raising uh, this critique, um, then it's a bit problematic. So, so the, first of all, the critique only stands or can even be considered, I'm not saying that it prevails, but it should be considered if we have well-functioning democratic institutions an open political process where people can participate and you don't have what these marginal excluded sections of the population that have no voice to basically talk about their own rights. Um, so that's, that's, that's the one thing. Um, this, however, does not mean that we should be completely apologetic about everything that an international court does is per se right, or democratic considerations should not be something that international courts should take into account. If you look at it simply like there's this top-down issue and the court has said it and the discussion is closed off, then we have a problem. I like the concept of, of deliberative uh, democracy, but the way Habermas um, uh, developed it, and what the court is doing is it's deciding a case, but the discussion continues. And the discussion continues not only with the court, but with this other group of actors that I was, that I was telling you about. So discussions on rights are never really closed off. You have a case that's closed off, and then you keep on talking um, about the matter. So should courts be more careful and like especially socially sensible subjects? Well, they should definitely be more strategic, perhaps even more incremental, give time maybe for some of these uh, processes to go on. But that doesn't mean that they should um, sort of decide that some topics are simply off. Um, yeah. It, it will not be dealt with at all. Thank you. And um, there was one question about sort of the, the shrinking civic spaces for civil society involvement. And you don't have to go to, to Asia to see these problems. We, we see that in very real terms in a number of European states as well. Look, look at Hungary, look at Poland. We, were just, we just came back from a, a training back in April in Turkey where we engaged with domestic actors, a number of them who were very junior, much to my surprise, until I realized that their superiors have been uh, thrown in jail uh, or again, gone to exile. 
Um, so this is a real, a real problem, I would say. And of course, I acknowledge that when I, when I suggest that NGOs engage with the government agents, with a coordinating body, and try and work with them on the, <laughs> on designing the remedies, this uh, will not work in every domestic context because of these pressure, the pressure that is being put on on civil society organizations. A number of them have won cases on their own. And they are then pushing to have these cases in their favor implemented at the domestic level. And this is where I think the European level, speaking about the European system for a moment, um, it can, can be this additional lever. In Turkey, for example, we didn't even talk that much about domestic advocacy for a judgment implementation, simply because the one hope that currently a civil society organization in Turkey is civil society organizations in Turkey have is that their voices will be will be echoed by the European um, institutions in Strasbourg, and not just the European institutions from the Council of Europe, but also, and I think this is a dimension that the European uh, the Human Rights Implementation Project has also looked into, the linking up of outputs from various international and domestic institutions, be that the UN. The EU, which always comes with uh, financial pressure, which we have heard from interviewees, can really trigger things up at the domestic level, and the Council of Europe institutions. So I should have added a, a final recommendation, in fact, to my recommendations to the Committee of Ministers, saying that they should routinely uh, inform the European Union of implementation shortcomings when they look at the um, association agreements, for example, implementation of other cooperation agreements with certain states. Um, so I'm afraid I don't have a blueprint of what one can do in a, in a situation where there is hostility towards civil society organizations. It is definitely about linking up better um, the various parts of civil society, including academia, including national human rights institutions, including ombudspersons, etc., and, and, and keep, keep on keep on pushing and trying to seek out international allies as well. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Um, Carl Buckley, Barrister in the UK. I specialise in international law, transitional justice and human rights. Um, and it's part contribution, part question, I guess. Um, I'm in the fortunate position that I filed cases before pretty much all international tribunals in one way or another including the Inter-American Commission, the ICC, um, and the African Commission, as well as the European Court. And my concern in how we approach this is with the increase of political influence over such tribunals. And we look as a prime example, the US removing the visa of the OTP at the ICC. Uh, then we have the Afghanistan decision of whether there was a political influence there. We then look at the rise of populist governments and leaders who are seeing and arguing that any court decision that isn't a domestic decision is an inappropriate interference with sovereignty. We saw this in the UK with Brexit as far as the ECJ is concerned and a lot of people try and think that the, the ECJ is the same as the European Court despite the fact it's two entirely different things. My concern is that this will also happen in Central America with the rise of populist governments there and the Inter-American Commission. Um, my own personal experience with the African Commission, there are certain countries that are overtly difficult as far as the Commission is concerned and the Commission is not empowered to take action against those countries despite the fact that credible cases have been filed. Now it's slightly different as far as the European Court is concerned in that most of Europe is more respectful of the decision and what the court is trying to do. However, we can also draw a bit of a comparison with the UN system of protection and whether you agree with the Assange decision in the working group in arbitrary detention or not, the fact is the UK government rejected it out of hand despite with it being a state party to the ICCPR, it is obliged to take it into account. So how do we seek to strengthen these international tribunals and bodies in the face of political influence and growing rejection from populist governments and leaders? Thank you. Yes, right at the back. 
I'm sure lots of people um, here will be aware of the decision that was recently handed down by the Supreme Court in uh, CN and GN and Poole. Um, it's quite an interesting decision because despite the fact that there is a whole range of um, Strasbourg jurisprudence that could be referred to, and in fact was referred to by many of the interveners in that case, the judgment contains absolutely no reference to any Strasbourg law at all. And so I was wondering, um, particularly this is a question for um, Mr. Justice Singh, but in real time, how do discussions amongst um, jurists happen uh, when deciding what to include and uh, refer to when they're writing decisions? Um, and particularly in the context of this decision, I'd just be interested to know um, his views about why perhaps human rights ended up not being included as part of the mix um, that the Supreme Court handed down. Could you just re repeat the case again? Sorry. So it's uh, CN um, and GN and Poole. It's, um, it's a case concerning uh, public liability um, of local authorities in relation to um, abuse to children committed by third parties. It came out. Um, it was last. It came out last week. Thank you. Good. Yes. Thank you, uh, Philip Leach from Middlesex University. I thought all three of you, in, 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 in very engagingly, spoke in different ways about the importance of dialogue as, as, a, as an element of, of implementation. And I just wanted to ask you if, um, if you, what would be at the top of your list in terms of trying to improve the dialogue that you referred to in the different ways? How, how would you, what would be one thing that you would uh, propose to develop the dialogue? Thanks. Great. Um, I, was, I was conscious also that Per and Rachel spoke earlier and we didn't have time for questions. So if you feel comfortable, we could also possibly invite questions or I may just ask you to respond to anything else that we've heard uh, um, before we finish. Um, great. So we've had uh, yeah, a question about um, the idea of supranational institutions being, by definition, always interfering illegitimately. And of course, we've had very uh, stark examples of that in the UK in terms of the very disrespectful uh, treatment of Philip Alston's report, for example. I noted yesterday the government accepted, in fact, that it was factually accurate, which was quite something, and we're objecting <laughs> to the tone of it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, do you want to start with that? You mentioned this sort of almost contagious effect between the different regions, so that might be something you could pick up on. Right. So, so yes, the, um, the thing about the <coughs> system is that this, this element of, of backlash or resistance against it is really nothing new. So it's um, basically it's gone through its history from, from one crisis to, to the next. So its heyday was more or less in the 2000s where the democratization agenda was like at its best, but then that started to decay as with this consensus started to, to decay again. Before that, I mean, you had Argentina and Chile who were like mortal enemies uh, with the commission truly wanted to destroy it. Um, and then, at that moment, the US plays a, a different role within the system to sort of save it, make the human rights system work, and other countries like Venezuela and Costa Rica. Um, and then, sort of, in the 90s, you have the Fujimori in, in, in Peru, and he was also attacking the court, um, saying they don't, you have absolutely no idea what it's like to live uh, in terrorism. All your judgments are basic, based on sort of like fairyland, um, conceptions of, of what it is, um, and even that sort of uh, went away. I mean, Fujimori kind of fell um, due to his own uh, corrupt practices, but his inter-American system lived on. And then you had Venezuela, who had a complete plan to basically destroy the inter-American system, creating parallel institutions, paying off um, its um, other states, the Caribbean states, especially the Central American ones, within the OAS to always attack and vote against the inter-American system to start a strengthening process which, which actually wanted to weaken it. And even then, sort of in these moments of crisis, well, what we have seen is there's always someone who steps up to save the system. So, should we talk about strengthening the court as itself? Okay, that's an aspect of it. But actually what we should be strengthening is the ecosystem around it because they are the ones that allow the institution to be resilient. Um, and to be able to live through these threats and actually sometimes even go out and um, be strengthened by them. 
Um, Rabindra, you were asked a quite specific question about one case. I don't know if you feel comfortable to respond to that, or perhaps more generally on the issue yes. of how you decide which yes. of the jurisprudence to borrow. I'm afraid I, 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 I can't comment on that individual case. But the more general point I would make is that, as a general matter, we certainly find interventions by expert NGOs extremely helpful. And that can be particularly so in cases which may arise in a particular field of legal practice where those who are directly involved may not always be the most familiar with human rights principles. And if I may give an example of a case I do know about, because I was a member of the Court of Appeal about 18 months ago, we had a family law case which was an appeal from the family court and concerned very sensitive issues about balancing different rights, uh, what I would call the rights of a minority within a minority, uh, because it concerned people who were all members of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. But within that, it concerned a transgender person. And the intervention, which I believe was by Stonewall, uh, was the only written submission that the court had which dealt with human rights law and equality law. And we drew on that considerably in the drafting of our judgment. Thank you. And the first question on improving dialogue. You made it sound pretty good already, in fact, at the UK level in terms of judicial dialogue. I think, I think, I think in terms of the judicial dialogue, it is. Uh, one of the things that perhaps inevitably has happened in recent years is that public spending cuts have inevitably meant that uh, relatively low priority is given to judicial exchanges. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, there would be regular judicial exchanges with not just with the Strasbourg institutions but also with the courts of countries like the US, uh, Canada, Israel, India. Uh, now that's become much more difficult uh, and that literally in a sense is impeding dialogue. I mean I think it's quite evident if you read say the recent judgment of the Supreme Court of India on gay rights. Uh, it's, it's quite clear, I think, that all around the world we are seeing, if you like, a judicial dialogue taking place about this very important issue. Uh, after all, in, in the context of Europe and the context of Ireland, Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland, it was only relatively recently that we arrived at a similar position. Uh, so I think that it's definitely a, a good thing. Um, I, I fully understand, of course, the, the, the practical and monetary constraints, but I think it would be good if we could have literally those kinds of physical opportunities for dialogue. This is exactly a point I would have raised as well. Going back to the Romanian example I gave at the beginning of my intervention, it was quite, uh, quite striking that uh, our NGO partners really emphasized how important it was for them to feel like they were heard at the domestic level. So I don't have a, a, a blueprint of how to improve dialogue. I would say normalizing it would be a key, a key point. And I do think that the international systems can um, have a very important uh, role in, in doing that, in pushing for that. At least in the European <coughs> system, there are already certain incentives for states to engage in good faith, or to at least engage. For example, if a Rule 9 submission is made, if, it, if a, an NGO communicates to the Committee of Ministers, it is expected that the state respond. If it doesn't respond, the NGO submission will eventually find its way into the, into the public and it will be transferred to the Committee of Ministers who, can take note of, who will take note of it. Um, if the government fails to refute the allegations and the claims made by the, by the um, by the NGO, it reflects badly on them. So it's this type of incentive that I think is incredibly powerful. And it could go further by, for example, as I mentioned, 
the Committee of Ministers requesting that domestic dialogue in, be an inclusive endeavor. Um, and I think it is peu à peu that, that we're moving into that direction, hopefully. Did you want to talk about the dialogue? Um, um, in the inter American system specifically, there's something I would really like to see in order for dialogue to, to improve. So I think the way it works right now, especially if we only consider what takes place between intermediate court and national courts, is that national courts either kind of adopt wholeheartedly whatever the intermediate court says without really kind of thinking about it, contextualizing, etc., or they just use very blunt instruments such as sovereignty, etc., to just reject the judgment. So there's no real engagement of, art, sort of, of arguments between, between these two courts. There's no real legal discourse um, that, is, that, is, that is occurring. So I think what I would like to see is have courts that are, there are some very talented courts out there um, that can engage in good faith and show the inter-American court how they got it wrong or how they can get it better. Uh, not necessarily challenging the concrete judgment, but challenging the interpretation um, of the law so that the Inter-American Court can also correct course when it goes too far, when it goes wrong, which it sometimes does. Great, thank you. Thanks. We do have round Yeah, of course. Maybe perhaps to add uh, one, one, final, one final thought is, I believe that a lot of dialogue is already going on, but we simply don't know about it. So I would like to see the media actors, a number of media actors pick up on, on stuff like implementation. It's not considered sexy, even though it's extremely sexy, because it impacts on our lives <laughs> every day. So um, maybe just opening the door behind which uh, behind which dialogue is already um, ongoing is kind of another um, important important uh, way forward. Somebody's researching it, yeah. Judge Hello, my name is Robert Spam. I'm a judge in the European Court of Human Rights and one of the two vice presidents of the court. And I thank very much everyone for this debate this morning. Uh, one comment and, and, a, and an anecdote about judicial dialogue, which I think is important for our purposes. The first is there is a development in the Strasbourg courts processes, which we are seeing, which is extremely important for us. And it goes a little bit to what Justice Singh was talking about, and that is our ability to get information from NGO civil society already at the adjudicatory stage. We must realize that the Strasbourg Court is, is completely divorced from the actual execution process. Differently from the inter-American courts, we, we are not in the business or shouldn't be in the business of uh, providing for remedial measures in our judgments, even though we do quite often, and I think to some extent in some areas, even increasingly consider it necessary for us to try to give some guidance <coughs> on how this moves forward. My point here would be, I think when it comes to it, in my experience, when NGOs have one detected a very important systemic case that is already ongoing, and are willing to take the time to give us on the ground information from an NGO in a particular state in question about the systemic problems, legislative problems, just problems of practice, even based on social science information. That is incredibly useful. We mustn't forget, uh, Diego Simena was talking about a number of cases. We actually, the Strasbourg Court, get about 40 to 50,000 cases a year. And we have now pending approximately 55,000 cases. So the problem is often you have a mass of cases and you want to do your best in every one of them, but you need sometimes outside input to be able to detect those cases where we need to focus more than others. The anecdote relates to judicial dialogue. I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, Justice Singh about the fact that dialogue not only occurs between judges in our, in our judgments, in our decisions, this judicial dialogue, stricto sensu, but what we, and there is a policy in my court, in, our, in the European court, of actively trying to meet our counterparts. And I have to say, of course, uh, me and Justice Singh sitting down both from Western European countries with you know, histories of uh, democracy and constitutional thinking is one thing. 
But when I've had the opportunity to meet judges from, let's say, more or more recently democratized countries who have a completely different background, and when I'm able to sit for a full day with my colleagues, have an interchange face to face, I often, I always go out in these meetings saying, we have done more work here today than we could possibly do, even with a line of cases in a particular field. My last question goes to, because the inter-American system is, is one where, where I, I have some information, but not enough. I would be interested to know whether in the inter-American system, the court has actually very much formalized its extrajudicial engagement with the NGO community. Are there regular meetings? Are there, and so forth. Uh, because what I would like to see is, uh, you mentioned why doesn't the execution department hold these annual meetings? We, of course, hold an annual meeting with the NGOs, but I think there, and of course, we have to think about judicial impartiality and all of that. We have our meetings with the agents, but I think there, there is more work to do, and I think that is one of the things we should be looking forward to in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you had your hand up. Uh, I have one particular case. Uh, my English is not very good, but this is my case. Uh, and um, I was being judged in 2009 with uh, child abduction on fake documents uh, sent from Peru. And I tried to take this uh, case to the court of, uh, even to the court of appeal here, but they didn't find um, um, merits for the case. And I consider this is something that is happening in uh, now 97 countries, uh, members of Hague Convention uh, 80, 1980. And uh, I would like to fight. I was looking for an uh, NGO uh, who can help me uh, for 10 years. And I'm slaved here in this country for 10 years. And I'm looking for somebody to help me. And I don't fight anybody. And this is related to my daughter who grew up as a slave under this terrible uh, convention and really I just I'm just asking begging for begging for help because I don't know what to do with this and I know this there is a lot of people a lot of children in, in the world who is suffering under this convention thank you very much for that and um, I'm not sure if any of our Panel can help directly with that. I don't know if anybody else in the room may wish to perhaps speak to you personally over lunch. That might be um, okay. a, a better way forward. Um, so uh, don't, don't, don't invite the panel, but it, it may be something that could be better addressed face to face, perhaps. But thank you very much okay, for thanks. sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, one or two more questions. Okay. Um, you have to direct question by Judge Spahner. Um Right, and then um, if some of the other speakers after me um, have a better answer to this, then I also urge you <laughs> to, ans um, to answer Judge Spano because what I, the information that I have is not, not exactly, not necessarily, I'm not 100% sure of it, um, whether the court has formalized its extrajudicial engagement with NGOs. So what I know is, for example, there are some very formal, the, the commission has a lot, has quite formalized uh, interactions with with NGOs and NGOs are always I don't know always but they pretty much always invited to hearings that it holds periodically on thematic issues and on country issues. The commission. The commission, yeah. right? Um, but basically, anything that starts out at the commission will make its mostly will make its way um, um, to the court. Um, and then what the court has is. This, these itinerant sessions, right? So um, it does it several times a year. It holds its hearings in a different, um, in a different uh, state um, party, and these sessions are not so they're not closed door affairs, but they're actually an opportunity for local NGOs, for now not only NGOs but for local judges and other national authorities basically see the court in action and it's not only about it's so so the court is in action but at the same time there are conferences there are sort of informal conversations um, etc and then I believe that within compliance proceedings 
particularly those NGOs, definitely those NGOs that participated in the case are also invited to give their view during compliance, um, during compliance proceedings. So, exactly. So maybe some of my other colleagues will be able to give you even more information. So formal and informal groups, yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to make any closing remarks either of you. Can I just pick yeah. up one point uh, about implementation uh, in, in a more general sense and really picking up something I think that both Murray uh, said in the introduction and uh, Per Engstrom mentioned in his presentation earlier today, which I agree with, which is that it, it's not just about courts, it's not just about national legislatures or the executive or even NGOs, but every institution offered at a local level, like the prison, uh, like the police officer. Uh, and, and one of the things that happened when the Human Rights Act was being introduced 20 years ago in the UK, police officers' oath or affirmation of office was changed so that every constable on assuming office had to uh, say that one of the things that they were going to uphold was people's human rights. And I remember talking at the time to the Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police, who was very proud that he had managed to get this through what was then called the Association of Chief Police Officers. So it's just one small example of, of the point I think Murray was touching on about Eleanor Roosevelt and small places close to home. Thank you. And section six of the Human Rights Act being, I think, often the most undersung uh, part of it. Yeah. And your Pair of Rich, I don't know if you want to have the last word, given that you didn't have any chance to wrap up before. No obligation to do so, but just. Uh, How far are we from that? Do we have We all work. Um, no, I have a small thing. Was that I have a very small. Uh, just picking up on um, Ethan's question, actually, around lack of resources for uh, the international bodies and, and you know the ideal being that you do all these tasks and you monitor and so on. Um, I think what we've seen is is part of the challenge for supranational organisations and treaty bodies is determining what their role is. And I don't think there's a single role, simple role in terms of monitoring implementation. So it can just be a case of gathering that information. It can be nothing. It can be a case of gathering the information simply from the parties. It can then go further and gather information from um, organisations and civil society organisations that are not party to the case, which then requires additional resources. Um, it then can go further in terms of making an assessment on whether that is sufficient or not. Um, and also getting in got involved in the dialogue and facilitating that dialogue and so on. So I don't think there's a single role, um, they don't have to play all of those roles. And I think it, part of it sometimes is about, about being strategic, um, going to your point you know, about what their role is. And I think some of the treaty bodies that we looked at have not necessarily determined their own role. And, and that's where some of the challenges came. So just in response to, to Eva's question, thank, thank you. Um, well, quickly, but there's a big question. So there was a question somewhere from um, about political influence over international tribunals and uh, right and the, the so-called populist backlash. Um, so um, big question, short answer. Um, international tribunals have always been political bodies, right? Um, so I think when to flip it and just be amazed over how politics doesn't fully consume. <laughs> Uh, what did national tribunals doing? So that's a short, short answer to that. Um, so political influence has always been important and always shaped what international tribunals are doing or not doing, right? And so uh, there's of course a lot of um, discussions and controversies around the ICC, particularly around this, because it's so perhaps it's more blatant and in, in some other, of the other contexts, right? So what was the response to that? So one is, I think, just recognize that law is politics and politics law, right? But more, I think, importantly is to think of the political strategies that the national tribunals can adopt to deal with that. And I think actually courts and judges do that, but they may be reluctant to um, recognize and at least publicly acknowledge that because of the illusion of law as being distinct from politics. Right? And, and, and the second thing which I think is important, my colleagues kind of really in push and particular on ICC on this point, is that in the case selection and in the development of cases, that needs to be a political analysis of what the likely impact of both case selection and the impact of how proceedings 
um, uh, take place in, in specific cases in country situations. Right? So for those of you who haven't read it yet, um, my colleague at SOAS, uh, Phil Clark, has a really excellent book on disinjustice just coming out, so I'm making a plug for him. I, I, take, I take a cut. But basically, his point is that, that the, the OTP in particular needs to be far more politically savvy in the ways in which it, 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 it processes cases. Right, so that, that's what I, this is delicate business, right? In terms of of, of retaining the illusion of, of, of law as something distinct and, and from 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 this. On the second thing, just like on the public, so-called populist backlash, um, I, I you know I really so again it's nothing new as such. I mean I really agree with that kind of generals like we've been here before, right? Um, but also um, I think it is really quite important here to make. Um, you know, the, the, the technicalities of the law kind of real for people who are most directly affected by it. Um, so that's again a sh short answer to the big question. Uh, and that is to be far more pedagogical perhaps uh, in explaining what tribunals do and what cases are actually about in ways that make it concrete for people who are directly affected. Again, I'm not saying anything particularly radically new here, and I think is broadly understood by, 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 by most of the stakeholders. But there are some really kind of good examples of this, including here in the UK, right, uh, of, of trying to attempt to translate often the technical language of the law and the kind of institutional complexities of how the law works in ways that resonates concretely with people affected. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, great, well, it is now lunchtime. <clears throat> Oh, Murray, sorry. Murray, sorry, yeah, um, I can yeah. just very briefly respond um, to Jonathan Metz's <coughs> very um, personal uh, question. Um, and really, along the lines that Rabinda um, responded to, um, should we be responding to the critique? I think I just call it the so called democratic critique that we've seen in the Ridge Lectures recently. Uh, and how should we be responding? Which I think is a really, really important part of that question. Um, and I entirely agree with um, Rabinda's response to that challenge. Um, but there, there is a lot of material, there are a lot of resources um, in our judgments, in, in our legal resources. And um, the, the sentence that um, you quoted from Brenda Hale in the Guy Mendoza case reminded me of Lord Bingham's uh, sentence in the Belmarsh case when Peter Goldsmith, for the government, argued what well, is essentially Jonathan Sumption's argument in his um, <coughs> lecture that he made before he went to the Supreme Court, that um, the courts really should have nothing to do uh, with this challenge. He made a pretty broad non justiciability argument in Belmarsh. This was a political question. Um, and that was pretty summarily dispatched by Lord Bingham, saying, well, actually, no, because inherent in the concept of democracy is access to an independent court. Um, and as a part of our conception of democracy, we have to understand that it includes the, the concept of the rule of law. Um, and therefore, that goes with, what goes with that is access to court. And so that argument uh, didn't get off the ground. And the lesson I learned from that is that we need to, we need to engage with these critiques. Um, we need to do so respectfully. We definitely need to do so respectfully because everything is so polarised now that we can't just say we're wrong. We've got to take seriously the concerns which underlie it, the democratic concerns which underlie it. But we've got to contest these concepts where they're being wrongly used, where democracy is asserted as being something which displaces the jurisdiction of courts, we need to say, well, no, actually, that's not consistent with our tradition. Uh, there's plenty of our tradition which shows that actually inherent in that concept of democracy is access to court. Uh, so we've got an incredibly rich set of legal resources to, to draw on, um, but we need to do that also, and I agree with Pair, in, in an incredibly accessible way. We need to proactively engage with these arguments, um, not just with lawyers. We need to do it um, in the public domain, in the press, and the media. Uh, reaching much wider audiences, but always doing so uh, in a more respectful way. Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, especially to our three speakers. Thanks for all the excellent questions. We've had, um, if not optimism, then certainly dominant themes of resilience and uh, survival <laughs> and so on. So the challenge to the panel after lunch, which I think will be continuing some of the same themes, is to uh, to keep uh, being <laughs> positive. Um, uh, just as a reminder, if, if anybody in the room does have knowledge or contacts that may, I'm sorry to catch your name. Mine is yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
perhaps if you'd like to, to stay in the room so people know where you are and then so they could approach you if they feel able to, to help. Okay, thank you again for the